John 17, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them, as you have loved me. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. Well, we've begun a new series um, four weeks ago on the marks of a healthy church. And over the last um, two weeks, we have considered um, statements of Christ as he has referred specifically to the church. Um, two weeks ago, I taught um, from Matthew 16, the, the passage where um, Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am, and then who do you say that I am? And then he makes the statement that upon this rock, which was the rock of faith, but also Peter, that he was going to build his church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And then last week, um, Chuck taught from Matthew 18, talking on the subject of discipleship, and then specifically discipline in the church and um, talked specifically about how God, knowing what was going to be happening in the assembly, he wanted us to deal with, with sin and, and gave us then a, a, a systematic approach to how we can discipline, um, deal with that within the assembly. There's another passage um, that I think that Jesus specifically talks about the church, but he doesn't use the word ecclesia, which is translated as church. And that's from John 17. And that's why I had Chuck read that today, um, because it really begins us into where we're going. And so in John 17, as Chuck was reading, you heard him say in verse 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone. He's talking about his disciples, right? Because he's in John 17, this is high priestly prayer. He's talking to his father, and he's talking specifically for his disciples. But then he says, but I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their words. Do you get what was happening? He was praying for you. How cold is that? Again, he knew 
what was getting ready to happen. And not only was he preparing the 11, not necessarily the 12, because he knows exactly he's the son of perdition, right? So not as he preparing just the 11, but he's also preparing down the road. And he has the long look when he's talking to the Father. It's not just this previous moment. But look then what he says when he's praying for, for, um, for us. He says specifically, did, are we back on me? There we go, thanks. That all may be what? One. And you note he doesn't ask this just once. When he's praying for us, he says it once, twice, three times, and then a fourth time, all within a small little context. He says, Father, I pray that they may be what? That they all may be one. That they also may be one. That they may be one. That they may be made perfect in one. Why is it important? Well, so that the world will know. So the world will know that you actually sent me, Father, and that we are one. That you, Father, and me, and I am in you. Do you realize that the greatest testimony of the validity and veracity, and realness, actuality of God is the unity of the church? What do people condemn the church for all the time? Hypocrisy. But they see the hypocrisy rooted in what? Disunity. Discord. No oneness. But I think it's even more that this unity becomes the quality that is tying everything together, which we'll see in a moment, that we are to be made perfect. When the church is being the church, talking about healthy marks, when the church is being the church, when it is at full maturation, it will be unified. There will be a unity. It doesn't necessarily mean that we will think every single thought is exactly the same, but we will be unified in purpose. And that's what we want to talk about over the next couple of weeks. David began this, actually, in the beginning of the series when he looked from Acts 2 and Acts 4, and he spent a long time talking about the, the different building blocks of the church, but one of the major building blocks was the unity of the assembly. Note, coming through Acts 2 and Acts 4, again, everything in red, all is talking about what? Unity. Unity. They, in fact, they were so unified that they sold property so that they could be unified even in their material goods so that there would be no need within the assembly. And the Lord added to the church every once in a while. Daily. How do you think that's playing out? I mean, you get you understand that there's the, the sovereign side, God's side, right? He's working. But there's also the man's side. But we're also told that great fear fell upon the people. So there's two sides happening. Great fear is falling upon the people, and God's adding to the church daily. Why? Because I think people saw something different. There wasn't a bunch of selfish individuals thinking only about themselves. But all of a sudden, this group of people, who we know what they were like before, now all of a sudden have a conversion experience, and they're wanting to walk in one accord with these other people that they had no clue who they were before. Do you, isn't that kind of cool? I mean, I mean, honestly, you look around, none of you are my next door neighbors, you know? I mean, and Marsh has already walked out with my grandkids, so I can't even say that, you know, I'd, I'd know my grandkids. Probably none of you I would have known, apart from Jesus Christ. And probably many of you wouldn't know each other, apart from Jesus Christ. But you're here today because you have one common purpose. That's what we want to talk about. So David began to talk about that in Acts 2 and Acts 4. Two weeks ago, I talked about what I call the Amarda of the church, the four ships of the church. 
But note throughout each of these, then the, the worship, the discipleship, the fellowship, and the stewardship, they all bring together this theme of unity. You can't have one without the other. And they all stand together. They blend together. And we're going to talk about that um, even more so in the next four weeks. And so over the next four weeks, Lord willing, Lord willing, because um, again, as we talked about earlier, we have no clue, no promise that I'm going to be here by the end of this message, right? Or you might even be here at the end of the message, okay? Not that I offend you necessarily, but anyways. But, um, but we're, Lord willing, we're going to talk about Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. Take two weeks looking at that, verses 1 to 6 today, and then verses 7 to 16 next week. And then um, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, over the next two weeks after that. And so you can see the, the concepts there. We're going to look at unity of the church, the synergy of the church, the diversity of the church, and then the excellence of the, of the church. And why did I put a red box around those last three? Because the reality is that those last three really are an outworking of the first. We're going to be talking about the unity of the church. But when there's a unity in the church, there will be synergy in the church. And when there's this synergy in the church, there's going to be also within this, this concept of a diversity in the, in the church. But there's going to be a unity within diversity. Okay? And you can kind of see that playing out in our assembly even. Okay? But then there's the excellency of the church. And I'm not going to tell you what that is until we get there. Okay? But it's really, the, to me, it is the, the, the highest mark when we talk about the full maturation that, that's where we're going to get. Okay? And so it's really kind of an exciting thing. So without further ado, let's jump into this. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter one, uh, 4, verses 1 through 6. And so I want to read it since I had Chuck read from John um, 17. But we're memorizing this. So we actually sang this twice earlier, right? And, and we quoted through verses 1 to 3. So you kind of got part of this. And so, but let's read verses 1 through 6. It says, I therefore, who's speaking? Who's the I? Paul. Okay, so I, Paul. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called, with one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Okay? Short little passage. We're going to spend hours looking at it, just joking. Anyways, what is Paul's primary command, challenge, exhortation in, in this passage? Come on. You read it. I read it. I mean, I read it out loud, and you read it with me, hopefully. Right off the bat, what does he say? What's the, what's the exhortation? No, it's not be diligent to preserve the unity. To walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Do you get it? So we're going to talk about unity. I get it. But this call for unity is rooted in your calling. It's rooted in your calling. He calls for you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. That should lead you to ask the question, what? What's my calling? Okay? So we got to stop for a moment. Okay? What's my calling? So go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Okay? Okay? First, we're going to start in, in the, the, his context, and I want to read beginning in verse 15, okay? This is Paul's prayer for the, um, for the Ephesian believers, down to verse 23. It says, but primarily verse 17, it says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand, in the heavenly places. And you can continue on. Verse 18 is actually the verse that we're looking at there. But that you may know what is the what? The hope of your calling. Paul was praying that they would understand the hope of the calling. We'll talk about the hope in a second. But we're still talking about a calling. So there, this calling must be important enough that there's a what that goes along with it? A hope. Okay? So let's go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There's going to be a lot of go-tos in, in this. 
I'm not putting them up on the screen today. We're going to keep turning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we want to look at the beginning of verse 26. For you see your what? Your calling. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many of you, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, implied, are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus. So, you see your what? Your calling. Okay? Now, we're still not necessarily told exactly what our calling is at this moment, but one, th one thing I do know about my calling at this moment, and that is what? It wasn't based upon what? On my merits. There ain't nothing about me that's based upon this calling. It's all about God. Okay? And the other thing I know about it is God called me in order to, to put to shame the things that, I have, that do have merits. So if you think something about yourself and you're a believer, you've got to change the way you think because God's already said, you ain't nothing. So you can put yourself there. You know, you were what? You, you were weak. You, know, you, were, you were foolish. <laughs> you were base. You were despised. You're not. Yeah, uh, this is great, boy. Uh, someone once told me I have a really bad self-image. I said, no, I got a great self-image. It's I got it based upon the word. Everything I am is based upon who Christ made me. You get it? And if I think that I am something apart from Christ, I'm nothing. Amen. That's exactly right. Okay? So let's continue on, okay? Because we want to bring this all together. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'll begin at verse 6. It says, Therefore I remind you, Paul's talking to Timothy, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying of, on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Okay? So I have this calling, Paul says. Well, now specifically, let's get into this. What is then that calling? Okay? Well, I think God's word gives us a very clear statement on that. And I think you're going to find that that all is in agreement. But again, in Romans 8, beginning in verse 28, <coughs> a passage we know. It says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called, according to what? His purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. What is your calling? What is your calling? No, it's not. It's not there. It tells you right there. What's your calling? To be conformed to the image of Christ. Those are secondaries. Great Commission secondary. It's an outworking. If you are being conformed to the image of Christ, then you're going to do what Jesus does. What did Jesus do? The Great Commission. I'll make you what? Fishers of men. Why? Because he was. The more you become like Jesus, the more you become like Jesus. Do you get it? That sounds like a no-brainer, doesn't it? Sir, I went to school for to learn that. Anyways, it's an equative process. The more you become like Jesus, the more you become like Jesus. But you know what? If I got that, if I really understood that, and if I really lived that, and I was committed to that, it would probably change a whole lot of things that go on in my life. And maybe the world would know. 
that God was real. Because the, one of the only Jesuses, and I know this sounds cliche-ish, but it's true. One of the only Jesuses that people are going to see is the Jesus they see in you. Do you get that? That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 1. He didn't need, need it. I mean, if we weren't here to rub shoulders with unbelievers, he could take us out of the world. That's why you're here. But his purpose, his predestined purpose, see, salvation is not predestined. It's your, it's your um, sanctification that's predestined. He's predestined you to be conformed to the image of Christ. Do you get it? Now, this is going to be important because what you're going to find out is that's his predestined purpose for the church. It's one and the same. That's next week. For us to be conformed to the image of Christ. Remember that maturation process. So, one last one. Philippians 3, verse 14. You guys know this verse, right? What's it say? I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling I call of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark. Well, what is it on the, what's the context of it? Turn there, Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. What's the context of Paul stating that? He begins up then, in verse, um, verse 7. What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things for loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, dung, the things that maggots sit on, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, being conformed, that I might be conformed. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have already apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forward to the things which are before, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as be mature or perfected, kind of fun, have this in mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal it even to you, Nevertheless, to the degree we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Let us be what? Unified. Unified in what? Knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus. Becoming like Jesus. I really strongly believe that that is what Paul is talking about here. That's the goal. That's what he's pressing toward. Christ-likeness. And he says... Not as though I was already perfect. I haven't made it. Paul. Who said, said at the end, I've fought the, fa I, I, I fought the fight. I, I, I've, I've run my race. Henceforth there is laid up. But he says, I haven't made it. But then he says, let us therefore as many as what? Who are perfected. You are sanctified. You are justified. You are glorified. It's a done deal. Sadly on this earth. We're still going through the process. But you already are perfected. So if we know we are in Christ, then what should be the goal? What should be that same goal, right? To be of one mind. I want to be of the same mind as Christ. I want to know him. I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. So what should be the case when the body of Christ comes together? We should all be getting together wanting to what? To know Jesus in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. To be made conformed to his image in his likeness. That the world will know that there's a God and he's a real God. Sadly, I think that when the church comes together right now, I'm generalizing. I know that this isn't true all the way across. But we're living our own lives. And it's all about me. It's hard for me when new people come and I have conversations 
and I'm not thinking any of you, of course, because you're standing here. Anyways, but but for real, in in what I this is Bob. That their desires for a church are so shallow. It's about music. It's about twenty minute messages. The one I shared, I don't know if it was with the men's breakfast yesterday about folks, the previous church that left. Because we were too real. Testimony time was, we had that previous church too, we had testimony time. Couldn't deal with that. That was too real. And guys weren't wearing ties and suit coats. There were some guys there that didn't have ties and suit coats on. And some women didn't have long dresses. Now I'm picking, that's a, that's, but that's a real, that's a real statement. That's, I got that. You'll be surprised at the, the things I hear sometimes. And it just, I, I, it saddens me. The church, the church, should be focusing on what? Christ. He is our, our head. So, this is our calling. Our calling is to be conformed to the image of Christ. It ought to pervade everything I do. Everything I do ought to be focused upon that. Memorizing scripture, reading scripture, spending time in God's word, having a daily quiet time. That's a non-negotiable. It's an unshakable, unbreakable. As I mentioned in Sunday school, discipleship can go. Quiet time has to stay. Administrative meetings have to go. Quiet time has to stay. Years ago, I was ready to commit spiritual suicide. For real. I was ready leave my family, leave faith, leave, just gone. Just, I was out. Why? Quiet time went out the window. I justified it based upon, because of my work schedule, based upon spending time with family, based upon spending time with this, based upon, and quiet time went out the window. My walk with the Lord went out the window. My focus on Christ went out the window. What did I focus on? Me. Me. And when I began to focus on me, and it was righteous, good things that I was talking on me originally, but then all of a sudden my focus became on me. And those good things become not necessarily good things. And you know people who have potentially, quote unquote, walked away from the faith and you've done, done things and you question, how could they do certain things? Because they, they lost their focus. They weren't seeking the things of God anymore. They're seeking the things of man or themselves. Why do churches blow up? Because they're not focusing on Jesus. They're focusing on themselves. It's revealed, though, then in our conduct. See what it says there back in Ephesians 4? It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God... That's a wrong, wrong passage, sorry. I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness. With all lowliness and gentleness. With humility. The word there literally means lowly-minded. Lowly-minded. To be of a low mind. Now, that's not saying you're debased, but it's saying that you're not thinking highly of yourself. Romans chapter 12 is very clear on that as well, about let none of you think too highly of himself. Everything you got comes from where? From God. Now, it's easy. I'm, I'm talking to the choir, right? I mean, you know, we're in church. Bible, God, Jesus. Get it. But when we walk out the door, do we still give the book answer? Or now all of a sudden does it become because, because of my prowess? You know, I, that MBA, you know, I got that MBA from the, the best place. I don't have an MBA, so I can pick on you guys with MBAs. Anyways, but I know when I went to college, I went to, I went to Carnegie Mellon, okay, straight up, and I went to Carnegie Mellon, praise God, because I didn't know him yet, but anyways, because I had a scholarship. But other guys leaving, they didn't want to play mind games. I stayed. Why did I stay? Again, I was, un, I was an unbeliever. I don't have a class ring. Well, I should have got a class ring because that's the only reason I, I was there. I wanted the certificate. I wanted to say I graduated from Carnegie Mellon. Does it make sense? 
It was all about me. There was no lowly mindedness. None at all. I thought I, was a, I wasn't a prideful guy. You know, I remember when I first got saved, lust of the flesh, that was me. But lust of the eye, no struggles there. Pride of life, no struggles there. <laughs> Be careful what you tell God. I mean, God knows it anyway, right? But you kind of got like, oh, God, you know, help me with my lust of the flesh. You know, I'm, I'm thankful that I don't struggle in these other areas. And then God just kind of what? Shows you what a stinking selfish, <coughs> self-centered, egotistical snob you are and how you're lusting after things all the time with your eyes and it's not just flesh, it's everything, you know, it's just, anyways. Humbleness, humility. You have to have a low mind. Philippians chapter 2 talks about the mind of Christ. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in what? Loneliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. And look not every man on his own thing, but every man also in the things of others. And let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very morphe, very form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. That's the whole goal, is to have the mind of Christ. Again, be like Jesus, to have his mindset. And he was other-focused. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. Do you realize that comes all the way from the Psalms too? Psalm 113. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord from the rising of the sun to the going down to the same. The Lord's name is to be praised. And then it goes on. He humbles himself to behold the earth. He lifts up the needy from the ash. This great God who is to be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down to the same throughout the days is the same God who humbled himself. And then he did so in the flesh in Jesus. So who am I that I should be thinking so highly of myself? Again, we're talking about in the past. I appreciate respect and I appreciate reverence from that perspective. But I'm just a part of the body of Christ. This isn't my church. It's the one I go to. From that perspective, it could be my church. But it's not mine. Do you get it? This is Jesus. Don't do that to me. Don't make it mine. It's as much yours. It's ours. But it's really God's. And you have to have that mindset. So if you feel like I'm ever getting to the point where I'm not having that mindset, please lovingly speak the truth in love. Help me out. I've had people do that in the past. Okay? Sometimes I may be in a frame of mind to receive it. Sometimes I may not be in a frame of mind to receive it. Because if I'm not, if I'm feeling pretty good about myself and pretty prideful, that means I'm probably not going to receive it very well, right? But that's okay. Speak the truth in love. Okay? No one should ever become too important to be held to the standard of God. Amen? Okay. So keep going on. Humility. Then patience. <laughs> so it's one thing having a lowly mind, but then with this lowly mind, because we still struggle with thinking that we do things what? Rightly, right? Lowliness, gentleness, okay, that's meekness. Meekness, I should have mentioned that too. Uh, gentleness, because I put that up there with the humility. That's Because gentleness is a meekness. It's literally there. It's having power, but having it under constraint, not having to use it. There's a humility there. But then he goes on, then with long-suffering, long-suffering. Do you know what long-suffering is? Suffering. suffering long. That's exactly right. That's why they put it that way. It's having a long wick. A long fuse. Willing to put up with people. And we're, we're, we're going to get to in a moment with the commitment in a second. But patience. Having patience with others. Now, I'd never be a doctor because I keep losing my patience. So, um, you guys, all together. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, thanks. All right, so, but it is. It's How critically important is it? That's why James begins off his, his, um, his epistle, right? Count it all joy. When you fall into what? Divers kinds of trials, tribulations, temptations, right? Knowing that the testing of your faith, what? Worketh patience. If we didn't need it, God wouldn't help 
test this out a whole lot, right? Do you know where one of the greatest places to be tested in patience is? You f <laughs> Children, yes. Family. 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 Because you can't get away from family. You shouldn't get away from family. Think about it. Blood is thicker than water, they say, right? And so the reality is family's family's family, okay? You can leave all your friends, and your friends will leave you, but family's always there. The problem is that family's always there, <laughs> okay? And I don't, I'm joking, but you get what I'm saying, right? And so when there's the imperfections, you're, you're faced with the imperfections what? All the time. There's a reason why this assembly is called family, Bible church. And the reality is, the more you come as family, the more the imperfections are revealed. And the more we frustrate each other. Be honest. Be honest. You can look around and realize there are people who frustrate you. You don't have to live in this, I live in this world of utopia. Nobody ever bothers me. Get off of it. Anyways, the reality is, you're a sinner and you, or you're sitting around a bunch of sinners. And sinners what? Sin. Now, you're saved by God's grace, and you're being conformed to the image of Christ, and so hopefully you're, you're becoming other-focused, and it's not so bad, as, okay? But the reality is, it's still hanging out there. You know, we're, we're still there, and we're going to bother each other sometimes. Why doesn't he shave his beard better? I can't believe these, these, these things thing hanging out there like that. Or I'm glad he finally got a haircut. Man, he was starting to look like a hippie. And, you know, I mean, whatever, okay? But you get what I'm saying. So many times we're judging people based upon what? Appearances and not real stuff. And this is those things that bother us. Got to get over it. Patience with one another. Well, that leads to this last one, commitment. It, um, bearing with one another. Um, where do I want to go? Bearing with one another, what? In love, okay? So that's part of the patience. And then it says, though, endeavoring. Endeavoring. Endeavoring means to work hard at something, to be committed to the process. So, again, I said I got my degree in Carnegie Mellon, right? There were guys... Uh, Again, there were guys who quit, literally. Well, I was in my dynamics and equilibrium class, and it was one of those classes where it was, the, the, it was like 600 and something people in this class. It was like massive, right? All the freshmen got to take it. And, and the professor, and this is for real. This really happened. You've heard, heard stories at different places, but this happened to me. He, he, said, he said, he says, look around you guys. He says, there are too many of you. He said, Carnegie Mellon, is not going to graduate all of you, or your diploma is not going to be worth anything. My job is to get rid of two-thirds of you. Isn't that exciting? Look to your left, look to your right. Probably only one of you will be here for graduation. That guy was dead on right. Dead on right. I won't tell you their names, but I could tell you specifically who they were. They were buddies of mine. So this guy, he got an A in a class, decided to go to Pitt. He didn't want to play the mind games. This guy got an A in the class. He didn't want to play the mind games. He went to Duquesne University. I flunked with royal colors. I got my diploma. Anyways, it's not quite how the, the professor meant it. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Yeah, I lowered the SAT scores there. I lowered the GPAs. Anyways, so, but I was what? Committed. I was determined. I wanted that piece of paper. And so I endeavored. I endeavored. I did whatever it took. I didn't know how to study. I came out of public schools, and I don't mean that toward public school, but it was a city public school. And I was supposed to be the scholar, but I didn't have to study. I went to school three days a week. For real. Don't do that, kids. Okay? And so I won't tell you what I did in the other two days. I wasn't a good person my senior year. Anyways. But I didn't know how to study. And so now all of a sudden, I'm, I'm dealing with the consequences of it. And I had to learn. But I was committed to the process. And so I learned. And I had to work my way through it. And I'm not saying bragging on myself, but I'm just saying, that's the goal. God has taught me through the military, through situations like that. What does it mean to continue to push through 
things for a purpose. If you don't know how to push through it, if you're not committed to a task, it's pretty easy to what? To walk away. Do you know why so many divorces happen? Because they weren't committed. When they say um, richness and poorest in health and in sickness, they really what? They didn't mean that. What they meant was, as long as we're getting along and we have a whole lot of money and I'm getting whatever I want, I'm here with you. Till death do us, well, maybe not. Anyways, but how many people go through and they, 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 say the, they say the vow before God? Before God, they say a vow. And then they what? They walk away because they're not committed. One of the things in marital counseling, I try to always, if you can work through this 20 years from now, 20 years from now, oh, I can tell you 20 years from now, 20 years from now, you'll be so glad that you did. Because when you leave, if you leave, you're taking your problems with you. You'll be as committed to the next one as you are to this one. Work through it. Work through it. Our unity is going to be revealed in our conduct. How we treat one another. Are we dealing humbly with one another? If not, if I think I'm better than any of you, then I got a problem because I'm not focusing on Jesus. If I'm losing patience with you, I'm not long-suffering, and I'm not bearing with your, your um, foo-pahs, your, your idiosyncrasies, then, again, I'm not focusing on Jesus. And if I'm quitting very easily, then I'm not focusing on Jesus, because Jesus never quit on me. In the garden, in the garden, again, I, I share this. It, this is a, a mind-boggling thing to me. In the garden, Jesus says what? Father, if there's any way for what? This cup to pass. Let it pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. We've got to keep moving. It's reflected in our doctrine. We've got a lot to do here and not a lot of time. So um, passages are here. I was going to have us read through all these um, but we'll read through some of them. One body. We're going to talk about this more next week, so we're not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, it's going to be reflected in our doctrine. This is extremely important, okay? When we talk about being unified, being unified in truth is, is critical. The very first thing that he wants us to understand in this is that we're one body. But it's not just here local. I don't think he's just talking to us locally. I think he's talking globally. There is one body of Jesus Christ. There's one. It's sad that we have made it fractious. But we need to understand that Christ rules over his church, period. I'm not to be the judge. We'll talk about assessment at some point, okay? But I'm not to be the judge. I can be a fruit inspector, but I'm not a judge. I don't condemn. Romans 14 is very clear. Each man's going to stand before his own master. Do you understand? They're not going to stand before me. And the first thing I need to understand is it's not, this isn't my body. It's not your body. It's not anybody's body. It's Jesus's. And the others that are meeting, even you know, the one that meets across the road, it's not so-and-so's body. Assuming they're submitting to the headship of Christ, it's his body. We are just one aspect. So think about it. We're going to talk about the body of Christ and how each of you play a part within this little local body, right, of Christ. But we then, as a, ga a gathering together, are one aspect of a bigger body. How cool is that? We have a purpose. We have a function in the greater body of Christ. Again, if we ever think that we're it, we're the end all, take the things that we've talked about individually and now make them to us as an assembly. If we think that we've got it together and that everybody else is lesser than us, we've missed the humility. We've missed the mind of Christ. 
what we're talking about individually needs to be applied then to us as an assembly, right? That let nothing be done through what? Strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem other than themselves. And we're talking bodies now, individual, local assemblies, caring about one another. That's kind of hard. It's kind of difficult. It's easy when we're talking about within our little kingdom. But now all of a sudden, wait a second. You mean our king? No, we're, it's a greater kingdom. It's God's kingdom. We're just one expression of his kingdom. The struggle point. I'm not talking about ecum- ecumenicalism, okay? Truth is important. So I'm not going ecumenicalism. But I want us to remember that it's not just about Family Bible Church, Martin is Georgia. It's a bigger kingdom. So there's one body. There's one what? There's one spirit. John 14 through John 16, Jesus made it very clear about the Holy Spirit, okay? When he, when he was talking to his disciples that it was important for, for them, for him to leave, because when he left, he would send the Holy Comforter. He would send the Helper, who was going to lead him into all truth. He was going to convict the world of righteousness, of judgment, of sin. He was going to do all these wonderful things. And so he says, there is but one Spirit. One Spirit. And so you can see in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 and 4, and it will come up with the Lord as well. I think I have it in there. And we talked about it two weeks ago when we talked about who do you say that I am. There is only one Jesus. There is only one Holy Spirit. The sad thing is there's a whole lot of spirits in the world, and you can go 1 John 4, verse 1 to 3, and read about that where he says test the spirits because there's a lot of spirits that are in the world right now. And there's a lot of spirits that are testifying that they're of Jesus, and there are a lot of spirits that are testifying they're of this. And they're not the Holy Spirit. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 11, he says, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I'm feared just as Eve was deceived, so you may very well be deceived. And someone may come with another Jesus, someone may come up with another the gospel, someone may come up with another spirit, and you may very well accept them. And then he goes on and says that such are false workers. And I don't have, it's just three and four there, but you can go on because it's the same passage that we talked about two weeks ago, that these are workers of, of Satan. It's no marvel for Satan himself also transforms himself to be an angel of light. Therefore, it's no marvel if his workers also transform themselves into be ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Understand the scriptures. There are people in pulpits today pretending to be believers, to teach truth. They're workers of the devil. Leading people astray. I'm not telling you who they are. I'm not going to mention any names, okay? Maybe. Anyways, no, I won't. And so some are real. Some are clear. I mean, it makes sense, right? And some you're kind of like, ah, I'm not quite sure. But you remember Satan, when Satan came and he, and he tempted Eve, so just as Eve was deceived, right? Satan came and he spoke truth, but he mixed it with her. I mean, it was true that when they ate of the tree that they were going to become like God and they were going to know the difference between good and evil. That was true. But they were going to die. That was the lie. Do you get it? We've got to be careful because there's a whole lot of people speaking truth but mixing it with a lie. There's one spirit, only one spirit. Too many people are being led astray listening to a wrong spirit. It's hard. I get it. And, I, and I, I can't tell you I fully understand it, okay? I wish I, wish I had this um, way of putting, you know, like virtual glasses on, virtual reality glasses, and you, you know, see things. I wish I had, and I could put it on, I could see the spiritual realm at the very moment when, when someone's speaking to me, and I could see the, you know, and the sad thing is some people claim that. Oh, I can see that. I can see all that. Well, I'm not quite sure. It's not what the Bible says, but whatever, okay? Normally when they say, people who claim that, then they turn around and they claim something that's not biblical. You go, I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't know what spirit you're listening to or what spirit's guiding you, but it's not, my, it's not the Holy Spirit who's living in me. We'll just leave that there. All right, one hope, one hope. If you've been with us studying First Peter, right, what are we told in Peter? What is the hope? Let's go back there, First Peter chapter 1, okay? What is the hope? Remember, we talked about the hope of your what? Your calling. Okay, so we have the hope of the calling. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a what? A living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away. It's what? Reserved in heaven for you. What is the hope? Your resurrection. You're going to be in the presence of Christ. But here's the deal. It's not that you're just going to be in the presence of Christ, but when you get in the presence of Christ, what are you going to look like? You're going to have a glorified body. Go deeper. What are you going to look like? Who are you going to look like? Jesus. Do you get it? That, that's the goal. Remember, that's my calling. My calling is to try to be conformed to the image of Christ. That that's what the work. And so he who began the good work in you will continue to perform it to the day of Christ. Right? It's he who, who puts in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. That he's the one who's working to me. He's the one who's conforming me. And one day it's going to happen. This mortal will put on immortality. This corruptible will put on corruption. This guy who looks like Bob is going to look like Jesus. That's my hope. Because only, I, you need to understand, Romans 3.23 all have sinned and what? Fallen short what? Of the glory of God. Okay, you got that part. Why is that a big deal? Why is it a big deal that you're a sinner and that you've fallen short of the glory of God? Why is that a big deal? Say again, Gerard. I can't be in his presence. That's why you ain't going to go to heaven. That's why you're going to go to hell. That's why you're going to go to the bad place forever because you're not perfect. In order to be in God's presence, you've got to be perfect. If you're not perfect, too bad. We're all done. That's what we found out from the law. We're toast. Do you understand why you're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ? Because he's what? He's perfect. He's God in the flesh. He's perfect. That's why he could be the sin sacrifice for me. There was no defect in him, no blemish in him. And in that day, Romans 8, 28 to 30, is going to come to be real in my eyes. Whom he also did call, he also did justify. And whom he justified, he also did what? Glorified. I am justified. I am glorified. I'm just not looking like it here. But you know what? When I go through that portal, that's my hope. That I'm going to be like Jesus. And I get to be then in the presence of God. Not because of my righteousness, but because of his righteousness. Not because of my perfection, but because of his perfection. That's my calling. That's my hope. It's all wrapped up in Jesus. And if, I, if we focus on anything other than that, we've missed it. We've missed it. Failing grades. Uh, 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 uh. That's our hope. You can look at the other ones, all dealing with the same thing about our hope. Again, one Lord. This is so huge to me. Now, I know it's talking about Jesus. But you can see at the very end there, so you can look at um, how Christ, and this is again no brainer, Christ is referred to as our Lord and our Master. And so it shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody, right? We only have one Lord, one, one Master, one who is guiding and directing us. But that term Lord also, um, kyrios, is the word that is used um, to translate for Yahweh from the, the Hebrew to the Greek. And I'm mindful of the Shema. Again, the, the new covenant is built upon the foundations of the old covenant. And so the Shema, Jesus said this is the, the most important passage. And, you know, when, when we talk about, so what's the most important verse? I used to do this when I did Awana conferences. I'd ask people, so, you know, what's the most important verse? And I'd always get, what, John 3.16. Nope, it's not. What? Nope, sorry, not the most important verse. Oh, okay, how about Ephesians 2, 8, 9? No, nope, no, it's not either. It's not. And people are looking at me, I said, I have it on good authority. I have it on good authority. I know exactly what the most important verse in the entire Bible is. And they're looking at me like, what's the most important verse in the entire Bible? Deuteronomy 6.5. Deuteronomy 6.5. Because when Jesus was asked, he didn't debate it. He didn't, oh, man, there are just so many good verses. I mean, how many times you've heard me say, this is one of my favorite passages, right? It's like, okay. 
if Bob was asked, he'd be sitting there going, oh, wow, we got this, we got this. Let me just quote you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty. And when I get to Revelation 24, we'll, you know, we'll finally get there. Not with Jesus. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. But it begins in verse 4. Shema Israel, Elohenu, Adonai, Elohenu, Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the words which I teach you this day shall be in your hearts, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, whether you're sitting in a house, whether you're walking away, whether you're lying down, or whether you're sitting up. And you shall put them as a frontlet, or you shall put them as a sign upon your hands, and as a frontlet between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and on your gates. But be careful. That's when you go into the land and you have the wells which you did not dig and the vineyards which you did not plant and the houses which you did not build that you forget. Yahweh your God who has given you all these perfect gifts. There is one Yahweh. One Yahweh. One Lord. One Yahweh. Not two. Not three. He's expressed himself. Yahweh is one. He is Yechad. He has expressed himself in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but one Yechad, one, or one Yahweh. Jesus, Yeshua, HaMashiach, is Yahweh incarnate. I don't think this is just talking about Jesus. I think this is talking about Yahweh. Philippians chapter 2, at the very end, we're talking about the mind of Christ, Right? Therefore, God has given him the name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, I think, Yahweh, to the glory and praise of God. It comes from the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah, Yahweh is declaring through Isaiah that it is unto me that every knee will bow. It is unto me that every tongue will take an oath. It's a direct quote about Yahweh. It's who Jesus is. And so that's what he says in John 8, right? Verse 24. Unless you believe I am, I am, you will die in your sins. And when the Son of Man is lifted up, you'll know that I am, I am. Before Abraham was, I am, I am. And they took up stones to throw at him. I have one Lord. And so, it's not on there. Somewhere on one of these, it has First John about, oh, it might have been that one in verse 4 about the Spirit. When they declare that Jesus hasn't come in the flesh, they're, they're, not of, they're not of God. That's why Jehovah Witnesses isn't of God. Mormon's not of God. It's not my Jesus. And there's a whole lot of others I can go into more, and I, I don't want to go there, but we've got to be careful. It's not my Jesus. You get it? You better know the word and know who your Jesus is. One faith, again, Boy, how much we can get into this. And we'll talk some more a little bit about this next week. But there's only one faith. Now, there's two parts in this concept. There is faith. And so we understand that faith is, the, um, uh, help me out. Uh, now you're going, that's all I'm hearing. Help me out. Somebody say it. Faith is the, I think, faith is the substance of the things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not see. I think we just swapped those. Anyways, but that's the definition of faith. Without faith, it is impossible What? To please God, for those who come to him must believe that he exists, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So I get the faith part. It's believing, okay? But there is, in the concept here, a, uh, the, the concept of faith also talks about a core of articles of what you believe, okay? It's not just that I believe, but what it is that I believe. And so you can look up these passages, and it talks about that. That's a very important part of it, about the core. And so there is a part where... There is got to be unanimity in what we believe. That's called truth. God wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Truth is critical. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Again, I wish I had time to get into this, but it's one baptism, not multiple baptisms. I think it's one of the ways that, that Satan has, has divided our church. Not this church. The church. Look, the word baptizo means immerse, Period. Period, 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 period. And I know I'm going to, uh, like I'm kicking a dog, but, but that's what it means. 
Jesus could have used any ter term he chose to use. He could have used any, any mode. And I, I read, um, <laughs> I read a lot. Anyways, and it's amazing how many times people see that what this is, unless they don't believe in the mode of immersion, then all of a sudden, well, he can't be talking about that. He's got to be, well, he's very literal in everything else. Why isn't he literal here? There's one baptism. There's one. Jesus said, go make disciples what? Immersing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's talking about adults. He's talking about people who can understand. And after they understand, after you make them a disciple, then they get baptized. He's not talking about baptizing babies. And I don't get it. I mean, there's really good theologians. And it's like they are going to hide behind one verse in the, 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 about the Philippian jailer and his house were baptized. Well, this, is not, this says nothing there about a baby. You read into it. It comes from Roman Catholicism. That's where it comes from. And so when the Reformation, when the churches started breaking away from the Catholic Church, they kept things. Martin Luther, I know I'm going over time, I'm so sorry. Martin Luther didn't believe in infant baptism. It was Frederick of Augsburg who pushed him back into it. Because at that time, when babies were baptized, they weren't just baptized into the church, they were baptized into the country. They became um, citizens and said, you've gone too far in that one. If you, go to, if you, if you do that, I'm not going to support your, your Reformation movement. So he recanted on it. It wasn't a theological decision. Philip um, Ulrich Zwingli did the same thing in Switzerland. He recanted on it. He wanted to kill one of his own disciples over it. My, my, I can tell you stories. I'm very adamant on this. Very adamant. Um, it's one baptism. Satan is seeking to fracture the church, and he does it in many ways. There's only one baptism. It's in Christ. And there's only one God. And again, you can see I have it all up there because I knew we didn't have time when we got to this point. It's the father of all. He's the creator. He's Abba. So not only is he the creator, like he's the father of everybody on the earth, and he is, but even more importantly, he's your father, my father. If you know Jesus Christ is your savior, he is the Abba. He's your daddy. How exciting is that? He's above all. He's sovereign over all the nations and individuals, which means he's sovereign what? Over the church. Do you get it? He's the head. He's, he's in charge. He rules. He's through all. My, just amazing stuff. Um, through all. So I have Romans 1 up there because it talks about the wrath of God being poured out upon men because what made me known of God was revealed to them, right? And that what we know even of his Godhead is revealed in, in nature, in creation. And so man is without excuse. God has revealed himself through all and in. In you all. We're not talking about pantheism, but God's through all. He's the creator, and he's placed his mark on everything. It all belongs to him. And then finally, he's in you all, specifically talking to the church then. He's in you all. Individually in you all. And that's pretty cool. It's not, he's in the church. He could have said he's in the church. This was eye-opening for me this week a little bit. As I, as I did this a little bit. I've memorized the book of Ephesians. I've pondered on the book of Ephesians much times and stuff like that. But this part never really, boom, hit me as much as it hit me this week. Because of the, you know, trying to decide, you know, the election of individuals and election of the church and all that kind of stuff. But this is very specific, very individualistic, the statement that's made here. He's in you all, each one of you. He's in you. He's just not in you as a group. He's in you. As an individual. How cool is that? It's mind-boggling to me. I got the eternal creator God somehow living in me. And that is mind-boggling. So, in the end, are you walking worthy of the calling with which you were called? Are you honestly pursuing, desiring, wanting, hungering, hankering for being conformed to the image of Christ? Is that your pursuit in life? It's not just my pursuit because I'm a pastor. Do you get it? It's each one of our pursuits. It's got to be our pursuit. It doesn't matter whether you're a bus driver. Nobody's a bus driver, so I can pick a bus driver, okay? Doesn't matter whether you're a garbage man. 
It doesn't matter who you are. Do you get it? If you know Christ, that's your pursuit. Would your conduct be characterized by humility and patience? you got to understand, again, these are all plays, right? Because I'm talking to myself in all these things. Okay? Are you more concerned about your desires and doctrines or the unity of the church? This is a big deal. I can tell you, and I'm not going to, specific areas in our Constitution, in our Articles of Doctrine, that I don't necessarily agree with. I was there when they were written. In fact, I made the final copy of them. But there was a group of people that God was using to start this assembly, not Bob. Bob didn't get to write whatever he wanted to believe and put it down and ask other people to join him. So the things I submitted to, I'm not going to tell you what they are. It doesn't matter. There are times that I have to eat. So David talked about this a little bit, like with our elder stuff. You know, I'm excited we have four elders. But you know, it's a whole lot easier when you're the only guy. <laughs> you make the call. This is where God wants us to go, because this is where I want to go. Now, you get what I'm saying. It, but it does make it a whole lot easier, right? I prayed about this for five seconds, and, and I think this is where we need to go. But when you got four elders, and you believe that God's going to work through all those elders, and you're looking for consensus among them, you don't always get your what? Your way. I'm excited about that. It's abrasive to me sometimes. I'm being honest, because I'm what? I'm stinking prideful, and I think whatever that I think is right. But I know that his ways are higher than my ways, and his thoughts are far beyond my thoughts. And I know that I need to be held in check. And I praise God for elders. Is there then a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. You alone are the most high God. There is no other God but you. This is your assembly, not just this little local body, and it is. <laughs> the body of Christ, the church, is yours. You created it. You designed it. You came up with the plan. Forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, for thinking that it's all about us. Help us to be mindful of you. Help us to, to walk worthy of the calling with which we were called. <laughs> we didn't call ourselves. You called us. Help us just to be submissive, Lord, to you. And then to be willing to be submissive to one another, knowing that this is your work in Christ's name. Amen.